learned about static charges. So uh, how charges behave if they're not moving. But today we're going to start talking about moving charges. And the term that describes that is current. Uh, we represent that with the variable capital I. It has units of amps, which we write as a capital A, and current is a scalar quantity. So current is the rate of change or flow of charges. So it can be how much your charge changes or how much charge is flowing past a certain point. And so uh, you can do this with calculus and uh, current is the derivative of charge with respect to time. Uh, but for this class, we'll just write that as change in current over change in time. So remember, this means Q final minus Q initial over T final minus T initial. And the unit one amp is equal to one Coulomb per second. And if you'll remember, one Coulomb is a lot of charge. So on the next slide, we will calculate how many electrons need to move in order to generate one amp of charge of uh, current. We want to determine how many electrons need to move in order for one amp of current, knowing that one amp is equal to one Coulomb per second of charge. So to do that, we will, so I guess let me write it down. How many electrons need to move in order to have one amp of current? So one electron charge is equal to negative 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. So if we take one coulomb per second, and we know there are 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs and one electron. Then if we divide one by 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19, we'll get the number of electrons that need to flow in one second in order to generate one amp of current. And so when you plug that into your calculator, you would get 6.25 times 10 to the 18 
electrons per second. And so that's a lot of electrons. And we'll talk about, we'll come back to this idea of charges moving and how they move and uh, what what is actually moving in your in your wires uh, in a little bit. So any we've talked about current now and if one way that you want to think about current is like current in a wire. Uh, so this is analogous to water flowing in a pipe. So if you think back to last semester where we learned about fluid dynamics, uh, some of those same intuitions can help you understand current flowing through a wire. So one of the ways that we can influence how the current flows through a wire is by uh, introducing this concept of resistance. So resistance, we write the variable as capital R, and then the unit for resistance is this capital omega, which is kind of looks like a horseshoe. And this unit is ohms. And so resistance is basically uh, how oh, hard is it for charge to flow through a material? So something that has high resistance will mean that it's harder for charge to flow through that object. So things with high resistance would be things like insulators, so rubber or wood, and then things with low resistance are conductors like metals. So on the next slide, we'll talk about how we will relate or how we can calculate resistance and then how resistance plays with current. But before so now let's talk about how to calculate resistance. So we'll use this formula, rho L over A, where rho is the resistivity, L is the length, and A is the cross-sectional area. So resistivity is just an inherent 
property of a material. So if you look in your textbook, there's a table 21 or 20.1 where it shows you the resistant or resistivity of a bunch of different uh, materials. So conductors like common metals are very low resistivity. And then things like rubber are very high resistivity. So just to write down a couple of things like a metal like silver is 1.59 times 10 to the minus eight uh, resistivity. So the resistivity of silver and then the resistivity of rubber, which we said was a insulator is about 10 to the 15. And the units on resistivity are ohm meters. And so you can see this is a huge range of values, right? From 10 to the minus eight to 10 to the 15 is 23 orders of magnitude. So your material is gonna determine how much resistance your object has. And then uh, the more, the longer the material that the charge needs to flow through, uh, the more resistance. And then the, if you increase your cross-sectional area, then you're making it easier for your charge to flow through. And so your, your resistance is gonna go down. So conceptually, if your length increases, then your resistance increases. And if your length decreases, your resistance decreases. So that would mean that length of, and resistance are um, proportional or directly related. And on the other hand, if your area increases, then your resistance decreases. Or if your area decreases, then your resistance increases. So these are inversely proportional area and resistance. Now, how do current and resistance interact? So we said that current is the flow of charge and resistance is how hard it is for things to flow through an object. And so the way that we relate these two is in this equation, V equals I R. And this is called Ohm's law. The V is the voltage. This is current. And this is resistance. So if you look at the units, this has a unit of volt, this has a unit of amp, and this has a unit of ohm. So one ohm times one amp is equal to one volt. And in words, what this equation is saying is that the voltage 
guess the change in voltage across some material of resistance R is proportional to the current flowing through the material. So if I had some wire, and there's a current flowing through it, and this wire, because it has some cross-sectional area A, maybe I'll do has some cross-sectional area A. And it has some length L. Then the potential here and the potential here are not going to be the same. Or another way to think about it, in order to make charges flow through a material, you need to have one side of the object be at a higher potential than the other side. And so that's, this is the basis for how all of our electronics work. So if you have a battery in some device, what that battery is doing is providing a potential difference or one part of one side of the battery as a is at a higher potential than the other side of the battery. And that charge that causes charge to flow through whatever circuit that battery is plugged into and that powers the device. Uh, so this is hugely important for all of the electronics that we use today. Um, so we talked about Ohm's law. And if you were to make a graph of voltage, let's see, I guess it doesn't necessarily matter which one is which, voltage and current, or let's change. So this was the equation for Ohm's law. If we do V over I equals R, okay, yeah, this is good. And then if you were to make a graph, what you would see is that as your voltage increases, so does your current. And the slope of this line is change in y over change in x, which would be v over i. And if we go back to this equation, we know that v over i equals the resistance. So materials that have a graph that looks like this, are called ohmic materials. And so that should maybe give you a hint that 
not all materials are omic. So sometimes your graph might look different where your um, voltage versus current graph might look like this. And so materials with this kind of a graph are not or non omic. So, if in a problem you might say, like, or you might read this material is omic, and what that's telling you is that you can use this V equals R IR equation. If it says that it's non omic, then this relationship no longer applies. And they would need to tell you what the relationship is between voltage and current. So if you see this word, then it's just a, a hint or a clue that you need to use this, this kind of equation. So we've learned about current, we've learned about resistance. Now, how do we apply that to something like a circuit? So we're gonna come back to talking about circuits and especially resistors. So you've seen capacitors, now you're seeing a resistor. And so let me draw just a simple, circuit diagram with, you'll remember the two parallel lines that are different lengths mean a battery. And now this new symbol is a jagged squiggly line, and this is a resistor. So I also said that we would talk about what the different lengths of the battery mean. So uh, the longer line of the battery denotes where the positive terminal of the battery is, and the shorter length line denotes where the negative terminal of the battery is. And further, the if in a simple kind of circuit like this, where the positive term is, uh, will tell you what direction the current is flowing. So in this circuit, the current is flowing in this direction. And so you can keep that current going all the way around. And so let's say that I give you the voltage of this battery is two volts. And I say that this resistor has a resistance of five ohms. Then using Ohm's law, I can calculate the current flowing through the circuit. So voltage equals solving for current. So I'll divide the resistance to the other side. 
and now we have two volts divided by five ohms and that will give us 0 0.1, not 0 0.1. Zero point four amps. So now let me pose a question to the class. If I put a battery in a circuit with no resistor, what would be the current? in this circuit. Let's say the voltage is two volts again. Uh, the current here would actually be undefined. So if we wanted to do the same calculation that we did before, if there's no resistance in the circuit, we would set that to zero. And then if we divide something by zero, we would get an infinite current. So that's obviously not what we want. And a circuit that looks like this is called a short circuit. And so if you had a circuit like this, what would happen is you would just burn out your battery really quickly and that wouldn't be good. So you don't wanna build circuits that look like this. So that's one of the applications for a resistor is that you can avoid short circuiting uh, whatever circuit you're building. So if you're drawing a circuit diagram, make sure there's no closed loops where the Voltage is just by itself, otherwise that would be a short circuit. Okay. Now, what about combinations of resistors? So just like we had rules for combinations of capacitors, we're gonna have rules for combinations of resistors. And perhaps to make it more challenging uh, for you guys to remember, they are the opposite of the rules for capacitors. So if you have a parallel circuit like this with two resistors, then the equivalent resistance is, so you, the one over the equivalent resistance is one over R1 plus one over R2. And then in series circuit, the equivalent resistance is just adding R1 plus R2. So for capacitors, it's the opposite, right? Capacitors in parallel, you can just add the capacitance and then in series, you have to add their one over capacitance terms together. But for resistors, it's the opposite rule. So parallel resistors, you have to do one over the equivalent resistance and then add up one over each resistor. And then for series, you have to just add up the resistors. So if we put numbers to these, let's say one, two ohms, then 
for a series, that's easy. You can just do one plus two and you get three ohms. And then in parallel, you would do one over one plus one over two. So that's one plus one half, which would be, I guess I'll just, so this is two over two plus one over two, which is three over two, but then you have to flip it. And so the equivalent resistance is one divided by three over two, which is two thirds ohm. So you can take two of the same resistors and depending on whether you put them in parallel or in series, you can get a completely different equivalent resistance. So now we're gonna talk about power in a circuit. And if you remember from, uh, so power is gonna have the unit or the variable capital P and the unit for power is watt. And if you remember from physics one, power is equal to the change in potential energy over the change in time. And for right now, we'll just write that as U over T. And then we've seen an equation for the potential energy with in terms of voltage. So if you take a voltage and multiply it by a charge, then you get potential energy. And so just as a reminder, this comes from these two relationships. So voltage is KQ over R and potential energy is KQ1, Q2 over R. So potential energy and voltage are only different by uh, this extra factor of charge. Okay, so now we have this equation, uh, but what, what have we seen is equal to Q over, so charge over time. Uh, what variable have we seen that is that relationship? So this is, so remember Q over T is current. So power equals voltage times charge over time, which just equals V times I for current. So here's one equation relating the power that flows through a circuit to the voltage and the current in that circuit. Now, remember we have this equation for Ohm's law. And so as long as the material or your circuit is ohmic, then we can combine these two equations to generate two other equations for power. 
So if I take this voltage and I plug it in here, then I get power equals I times I R. And so power equals I squared R. Or if I solve Ohm's law for the current, then I get I equals B over R. If I plug this into here, then I get power equals V over R times V. So I get V squared over R. So depending on what the problem gives you, if you wanna calculate power, if it gives you current and voltage, you would use this equation. If it gives you current and resistance, you would use this equation. And if it gives you voltage and resistance, then you would use this equation. So they're all valid equations for power and you would just pick which one you need based on what the problem gives you. We said that if we have this kind of a circuit, voltage and resistance, that the current flows in this direction. So remember that a lot of this theoretical framework was developed before we knew what electrons were and that electrons were the things that moved. So what this current is actually telling us is the direction of the current is the direction that positive charges would flow but now we know that positive charges are not the things that move it's negative charges that move and so the current might be moving to the right, but the things that are moving are actually the electrons and they move in the opposite direction of the current. Then there are, so one more thing that I'll finish on today and then something that we'll start on next class. So most of what I've been talking about so far is called direct current. And so that's basically like the current or the electrons are just gonna keep moving in one direction until they get where you want them to go. That's one way that you can generate electricity. The other way is by having the electrons oscillate back and forth, and that's called alternating current. So we'll talk about alternating current next class, uh, but one thing to finish on when we're talking about direct current is something called the drift velocity. And conceptually, uh, the point that this conveys is that the electrons, let's say you turn on a light switch, the electrons don't need to travel from the power source all the way to your light bulb in order for the light bulb to turn on. Instead, what's happening is, let's say, since we know the electrons are moving in the opposite direction of current, 
So instead of this electron needing to travel all the way around here in order for your light bulb to turn on, and a light bulb is basically just a resistor, instead what happens is this electron, oops, bumps into the electron next to it, and that electron bumps into the next electron and so on and so forth until this electron is eventually forced through the resistor. So this phenomenon where the electrons are just bumping into each other uh, is called drift velocity or drift. And the velocity that the electrons or the charges are moving is given by this equation So V sub D is the drift velocity. A is the area of, or the cross-sectional area of whatever your charges are moving through. Q is the charge of whatever is moving. And N is the density, so the charge density. 